Good afternoon. Thank you for attending this open forum with Dr. Jeffrey Boyd, Provost at Tidewater Community College, Norfolk campus in Norfolk, Virginia. My name is Horace Chase. I'm interim president of Jackson State Community College. I'd like to welcome everyone that's watching via our video stream. And we want to especially thank Jackson Energy Authority, E Plus Broadband, and E Plus TV6 for streaming this presidential candidate forum. Dr. Boyd will have an opportunity to provide an overview of his higher education experience, his qualifications, and why he is interested in becoming the next president of Jackson State Community College. Following his remarks, we will open up for question and answer. Because we're seeking community-wide input as part of the search process, you are encouraged to provide anonymous feedback and use the survey at jscc.edu backslash presidential dash search. So at this time, I'd like to welcome Dr. Boyd to the stage. Dr. Boyd. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for inviting me to your home. I've had a great opportunity to, to meet many of you, to shake many hands as I've uh, gone across the campus and had a couple of meetings. So it is indeed an honor. I know choosing a president is probably the most important thing that you do on this campus. So I just want to let you know that I take this. I'm very humbled to have this opportunity and that I really, again, have enjoyed it. Just a, just a great campus, a great group of people here. And I know it's all about student success, which is always my focus. And I know the focus of many of you as we're here to help Jackson State move forward and help students move forward as we look to the help them graduate and uh, pursue their educational dreams is really what it's all about. So I want to talk a little bit about my, um, start out right what it asked for and talk about what, it, what is my higher education experience. Well, I always like to start first of all just to give a little background. I was uh, started my career as a police officer. So I worked as a police officer for nine years after receiving an associate's degree of criminal justice from a community college. One of the most important things that I always say that happened to me there was that experience. When I went to that counselor and asked her that I wanted, and told her I wanted to, to major in criminal justice, she asked me an important question. Well, do you ever think you want to go for a bachelor's degree? And I said, you know, I think I, I would like to someday go for a bachelor's degree. So she put me on an associate of art tracks. And what that did for me, though, is that right after I completed that nine years of police work, which is very tough work out in California, I was able then to go and I started working for Target I worked for Target as an asset, executive asset protection risk manager. And then at that point, I started to realize that I wanted to kind of do more, and that education was important. Well, I was able to go right away because I had completed all my English, both of my Englishes and my history and my psychology and sociology. I was very easily able to transition into a bachelor's degree program and complete. I was talking about uh, innovative practices, and it talked about, I remember, driving one day and thinking about I want to go get this bachelor's degree and I heard on the radio complete your bachelor's degree in as few as 18 months and back in the 90s I don't think cell phones were out but everyone didn't always have a cell phone so I couldn't wait to get to the the office and call and ask about getting into this bachelor's program well the counselor that I work with said you know we have a couple slots left give me your transcripts which I did so I was able to transition it right away as a working adult and get a bachelor's degree in human services from there, as I got that bachelor's degree in human services, I was hired by that uh, academic institution, Judson University, and right away after graduate, I was hired as an academic advisor, began to work with, with adult students and getting their bachelor's degree, which I had just completed. And then I have a California wife, and she may be watching uh, on TV today, so, um, and she had the desire to move back home closer to her parents, so being a good husband, I decided that I would listen to her and stay married, so we moved there, but I had a chance to go and teach high school there for a couple years and had the ability to teach high school history. And that was really what I say transformed my life, that I got to go and actually work inside a classroom teaching high school history, working with those students, and I was just telling some other day, I just got a text from one of those students, that was in 1998 to 2000 that I taught history. And, and so the power of faculty, which I'll again talk about a little bit more later, just the other day, that, that, from that experience of those two years, he texted me to say, I'm thinking about changing careers. Can you help me with my cover letter? Help me get on track. What do you think I should do? And so I know the, the, what happens in the classroom is the most important, that transition, that transcends. So we, we went on and then moved back to, back to Illinois after two years in California. Came back here and that's when I got my experience working at Wabansi Community College in Sugar Grove, Illinois. There was an opening for a uh, 
Minority Student Retention Coordinator. It was a two-year program that was on a grant, pretty much like your, your Tennessee Promise Forward grant. So it was a grant opportunity to go in and work with students that were transitioning in from a, a demographic shift in that college to work with those students on and helping them complete. That's when back in the early years, 2001, started really focusing on retention. And, uh, and so I was working, able to work with those students. We had tracked uh, 60 students. We retained 98 of those students from fall to fall through working in the hallways, working with faculty on plans to go and start getting faculty to be mentors and advisors with those students. And so we were able to work with the, the, the men's basketball team. And all these students did some great work uh, to try to get those students, to, again, to, to be retained and to complete their, their experience. So when that grant ran out, unfortunately, I could no longer stay with that institution, but it didn't stop me from desiring to stay in higher education. So I worked and got a, and applied and got a job at Olivet Nazarene University. Another, uh, it was a four-year school. They started an extension site out in the Chicago area, so I was able to go and run and open that extension site. And in that program, we, hi we helped uh, nursing students get their bachelor's degree. So they went and got a bachelor's degree in nursing. We, we started many of those programs in hospitals. We also had a master MBAs. We also worked with students on, on, on a program to get their associate's degree. Did that for a couple of years, but again, that was a time where there was a I had boys in basketball. I'll tell you, I had been married 33 years, have five sons. And so I had sons in, in basketball there. And through all that travel, it really got tough that I was on the road and couldn't get to basketball games. So I really had to kind of change that up. But I, I started my master's degree at that time. So from that moment on, I said, you know what, now, so I, I mean, I'll give you a little story about. So I got my, finished my associates at 24. I finished, then started a master's. I finished, excuse me, bachelor's at 34, okay? That wasn't enough, still lifelong learning. So then I said, I get this master's degree because as I worked at that at Wabansi, they said, now you need a master's degree. If you want to move forward, you got to at least have a master's. So great, back to school, get a master's at 45. And then my goal was to get a doctorate by, by uh, 50. I made it at 49. So, you know, a lifelong learning. So from there at uh, working for Olivet Nazarene University, after I completed that uh, master's degree, I worked for a short time with the Quad County Urban League. I was the director of education and employment, got to work a lot with communities and schools, start to work at some of like your extension sites, basic education, try to get people in communities that weren't going to school or help to get their GED and so forth. And then the opening came up at Elgin Community College for an associate dean position. So because I had worked and got that master's degree, my goal was to get into to higher education administration. So I went and applied for this, this associate, or excuse me, this associate dean position there, and I was fortunate enough to get that job. So I worked for that job for a couple of years. Again, worked at one of the largest divisions in the college, uh, career in tech. We had everything from automotive to business, accounting, economics, all the way as a, an associate dean, all the way for, to welding. So we had 22 programs. We handled about 650 FTEs in that division. So working with the dean, who was, uh, again, a very much of a mentor to me, helped me uh, complete and understand the educational process, evaluating faculty, hiring faculty, it was a union shop, so helping faculty work through tenure, working through it, all the different you know, faculty, staff, unions, and so forth. And then at about two years in, the vice president of that institution left. So then my dean was asked to be the interim dean of, uh, of this college. And so then I was actually out in California visiting a friend and got a call on, I only play golf very little, so don't, I mean, I'll start to play if I have to because I know you got to go out and kind of a lot of things happen on the golf course. But so one of the few times I was playing golf, I get a call from a faculty member and says, you know, young man. And then he talked to me like he was my dad, although he wasn't. He says, young man, they're thinking about moving you up to uh, interim dean. Do you think you're ready? And I said, well, I think I am. What do you think? He goes, well, the faculty think you're ready in the division. Just let me know if you want. I'm going to put the word in for you. So I said, oh, okay, I'd like to do it. So again, they had faith in me as an interim dean. So I worked that for a interim dean for a couple of years. And at that time, the president talked to me about getting the doctorate, said, you got to go. And I said, man, three years to get this doctorate. He goes, what's going to happen? You'll miss a few television programs. He goes, don't, don't worry about it. Get this doctorate. So went on to get my doctorate, uh, worked through that. And so the, the day, the week after I graduated in, in June uh, 2010, so I get a call from the president's office. The president would like to see you. And I'm thinking, oh, man, get a doctor and get fired the next day, right? You come in. So I was a little concerned with that. But the president came in, called me in and said, you know, we've seen the work with you. First of all, congratulations on your, on your doctorate. I'm not going to open the search. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put you in the dean position. And I was like, oh, man, Christmas early, right? But just the fact that I had faith because of the relationships that I built and working with people 
and because I, I worked well, not, not me, but I learned, learned the business and had faith and built the relationships that I was able to go on to be, again, a dean. So I worked at Elgin Community College from 2006 until 2014. So again, having been promoted from associate dean to dean, my, my president said, people don't get promoted that often in the same institution. If you want to move forward further, you're going to have to leave. And so, you know, it was hard to hear that, but fortunately my boys were at an age, my youngest is 21. I don't have all the ages right, but I know the, I know the you know, the, the, I know the book, I know the bookends, right? 21 and my oldest is 33. So they were all out of the house. So I started to look for opportunities where I could move forward. So, you know, I could look at vice president's jobs or I could look at, um, jobs as a provost and the position of provost at Tidewater Community College, a large school, about 40 some thousand students. So they have four distinct campuses. In some institutions, these positions are called campus presidents. So this is actually a campus provost, but I'm in charge uh, as a chief operating officer in a college where I run a campus of about 12 to 14,000 students per year, run all the full services of student services, uh, business services, financial aid, uh, library, bookstore, uh, student development, student services, every aspect, running deans, academics. So I was, I'm in charge of everything that's, that goes on at that campus, working with business and industry leaders. And, and so everything that really that a president does as a campus provost, I do in that position. So again, you know, you, then, then, you know, an opportunity like this comes up and you look and I tell people, and I'll talk a little bit in a minute about when I pull up my PowerPoint, not yet, and I talk about why Jackson State. But, you know, again, you look at opportunities and, you know, my, um, so that, that's my higher ed career. Let me talk a little bit about my qualifications, if you will. So again, talking about my, my um, bachelor's, human services, my master's in adult education, distance learning. And then my, for my doctorate, I, my doctorate is in community college leadership. My dissertation was on, it explored the essential personal attributes of aspiring community college presidents. Because in a career track, what was my end goal? I wanted to, I wanted to become a college president because in my study and my literature review, it talks about all the pending retirements of community college presidents are going to be coming out. They're going to be, you know, going to be happening a lot. And so it was a, an actual opportunity. I thought, you know, if I'm in this game, I think I have the skills, the essential skills and abilities to be a community college president. Why not go for that? Why not write about that in your dissertation, which I did? So for that dissertation, I interviewed three board chairs, I interviewed three presidents, qualitative study on the essential personal attributes of aspiring community college presidents. So I got a good run on what it is, presidential fit. Uh, how that looks, you know, the president's image of the college, fundraising, so all the aspects of study. So I've been very intentional in what I studied and what I've done as far as into becoming in, in a position to become a community college president. So that's kind of where I've come as far as hopefully to cover my higher ed experience, my qualifications, and now the Y Jackson State uh, thing in my PowerPoint things over here, right? Got it. Thank you. So. Just talk a little bit about why Jackson State Community College. Well, let me get it right. Whoop, that's me. Okay, why Jackson State Community College? Well, first of all, as I look at what Jackson State Community College values, I read about your, your value. Well, I too value education. I hope that's been evident by how I have been a lifelong learner to value education all the way through. Integrity, in my career as a police officer, in my career working for Target Asset Protection Risk Management, in my part of my career working with uh, you know students, minority student retention teacher, you know husband for 33 years raising five boys. There's a there's a lot. Integrity is very important to me. Also, so again, I think about what your core values are. You know that you value education, that you value integrity, and also excellence. I really believe in excellence. I strive for it as you do, and I believe you know excellent is the unlimited ability to improve the quality of what you have to offer. I think you always continue to strive for excellence, to be excellent in your programs, excellent in what you do in the community, and then also in, you believe in service in your core values. Well, I believe in service. Again, with the bachelor's degree in human service, it's all about serving people. You know, I, I, got, I, I got my bachelor's degree in human service because I really thought about starting my own social service agency because I really do, I think that serving people is what we all do. That's what we do here. Everything we do is about students, is about serving people, so I very much believe in service. And then in what you believe, believing in people. I very much believe in people. I, I love people. Two eternal things I believe in the world are the word of God and people, and I love them both. I think that you have to look at people, value people, 
make people feel you know important about what they do and that you know again you can do many things it just says mutual respect and teamwork you'll do great things and that's what it talks about there so I believe in people I also believe in success what are we here for we're on a success funding model it's all about student success it's all about getting And one of the great stories I like to think about when you think about success in 1962 John F Kennedy as he walked you know he gave his big speech in 61 and he talked about what are we gonna do Put a man on the moon, right? So as he was walking the Nassau Space Center, he was talking to a custodian who was with a broom, and he was, he was in John F. K. asked him, what are you doing? I'm helping put a man on the moon, right? So as we talk about what we're doing, that we're, we are here, our job and success is not to put men on the moon, but to help students complete and succeed. That's our job. That's what we have to do. So I think it's very important to do that. So again, believing in people, believe it in success. I believe in innovation. We've got to be innovative in our approaches and what we do. And then also, you know, we have to always continue to think about all those things as far as in what we do every day. And, uh, and I, I just want to talk about that. And so then again, why Jackson State? Do you recognize this guy? All right. Do you see this, who this is here? Okay. Hope I, you still recognize me, right? Take off the glasses. That's me. So why I show this picture, that was me the summer of, okay, 1979, graduating. When I graduated from high school, I looked up and I said, okay, now what? But I knew I wanted to go to school. I knew I wanted to go to college because I had seen cousins who had gone to college and they were the coolest guys in town. So I, wanted, I knew I wanted to be a part of that. But when I graduated, I didn't know what to do. I, but I knew I wanted to go to college. So then, long and behold, I went to, again, a small community college, a rural community college, much like Jackson State. It reminds me a lot of Jackson State, actually. And I enrolled in this guy's class, okay? One of his classes was Dr. David Murphy, the psychology instructor. And Dr. Murphy gave this great challenge. He gave a challenge that there was two things I was concerned about when I got there. One was girls, the other was basketball. The rest really, why am I going to school here really? But Dr. Murphy gave, me, gave this challenge. He said, okay, first day of class. Any of you in class can prove that human beings have instincts. You get an A for the class, you never have to come back. So back in those days, there wasn't internet people, you know. Me and another classmate went to the library and got all the cards, you know, go get those card files out. We were pulling out books, magazines. We were going to prove that human beings had instincts. Well, guess what? Couldn't prove it. I got a C in that class. But what happened to me in that class is what I call it birthed in me a spirit of intellectual curiosity. It made me think, you know what, this learning stuff is really pretty cool, you know, that's what you have to do. And so Dr. Murphy gave that challenge, and then fast forward, as I told you, I went back to Obansi, and I worked my first job at a community college. Guess who was still there? Dr. Murphy. And so as he saw what I was doing, the retention work, I was working with those students, he said, okay, well, I think you're doing great work, but the question I have is, what happens when your influence is gone? How do you measure once your influence is gone, how do you still know that those students are working? Are still working in what you're doing, and so. But I, but I, told, you know, I, and I still believe this. I'm a big effective domain person, and if I were to ask you to to close your eyes and you started and you thought about that mentor or teacher or person that made you feel like you could do anything, do you think about that person quantitatively or qualitatively? Right, class. Qualitatively, you can't measure how someone makes you feel, how it affects you. So that's what I call an immeasurable factor that is a big part about how we help students succeed. So Dr. Murphy, again, I, I, I love him to death, but just like I told you about that student who just called me the other day, right, it's still, that effect is still going on. Now I can't measure it. I can't say, well, 90% of the students that I've touched are going to continue to be successful, but there's something there, and that's what I believe we build. And I also believe faculty, you know, you, you know already, you touch eternity through your students. I mean, you know, those students, and you can think about those mentors and people that you have, that you have touched, and that, that is going on for eternity. There's no end to the effect that you have, that any of us have in touching lives and touching students, which again, I think Jackson State is great at that, and I, I'm excited to be a part of that, that challenge. So I really, I really think that's awesome, right? And now I'm trying to remember what my next slide is, you know? So do I have, uh, I think I, oh, okay, got it, right. I'm not at the, I'm not at the closing part yet, right? So. And I think about, again, why Jackson State? I think it talks about, in some of the stuff in the research, you want to foster a culture of, of, of respect and teamwork. That's all about relationships. That's all about getting out in the hallways. One of the things I've done as a provost of Norfolk campus, I was given a charge when I started to change the culture of this campus because for many years, 
Our president said this campus felt like second-rate citizens, like nobody cared for them. And they felt like the rest of the uh, with three other campuses had more going on. So what did I do? Again, walking those hallways, getting to know people by names, becoming part of their lives and know, hey, you know what? What you're doing is important. And now we have a moniker that we call ourselves Team Norfolk because we've changed that culture in those two years where now people, and what I love is people say, hey, we're excited for you for this, to get this opportunity, but we're sad to see you go. That means you should develop some good relationships. But we've changed the culture there, and it's all done by teamwork and treating each other well. I think that's the easiest thing in the world is really to treat people well, and that's part of the study as a president. That's what you do. You set that culture, and I believe that starts with the president. Open communication. That just means, again, as, as I've worked as a, uh, as a dean, provost, one example I'd like to talk about, open communication. So there was a situation that happened uh, about a year ago where there was a, a certain Facebook post that a, a, an employee had put out. And so someone brought it to my attention, and I thought, no, it wasn't illegal. There was nothing in policy to say that this Facebook post was, shouldn't be done necessarily. But to me, I was livid about this post. I thought, how can one of our people that are doing this job put this kind of stuff on Facebook? I had the plan. I was going to call that person in. I called their supervisor and said, I'm, I'm talking to him next week. I'm, gonna, I'm calling him in. I'm going to let him know that either you know, he's got to take this down. This is embarrassing to us. Embarrassing to me, really, I think it was, more or less. But it was embarrassing and wrong. And so that was my plan. The, 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 the dean, dean left, and he went. And then the next day, first thing in the morning, he was at my door. And he says, I, I slept on that last night, and I'd like you to let me. Um, can, I just, can I talk about this subject at a staff meeting and just make it more general so, that th so no one is singled out and that we can make it so it doesn't like we're picking on somebody? And I said, you know what? That's a good approach. Do it that way. So open communication is sometimes you've got to make tough decisions, but I would hope I would be a president that, again, as you know things are going to happen, that because we have relationships, because I've visited you in your workspaces, that you would feel good enough to come back and say, well, I know what you said you're going to do, but I've been thinking about this. And now it may not always work out that way, but I think it's very important that open communication gives you that ability. A president who's visible, I'm going to be out there. I'm already planning on going to a basketball game tomorrow. I saw the basketball guys out earlier. They're 5-0. I've challenged them. I can out probably shoot them in free throws already. I mean, I'm a 70% career free throw shooter, so I know I can, already do, I can already beat those guys. But, you know, it's all about being visible. It's all about we're, we're, you've got to be a family. And so the family, you know, just like I know as a, a dad, it's important that my kids see me when I was working. It's important. And, again, yes, my wife, we're all part of it. It's a team effort. So as a team, I want to be a person that's out there so you know that I'm part of your team and that I care about your concerns. I want to know when your, you know, your, 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 your child is going to have their Thanksgiving turkey day. Yeah, I want to know about those things. And when you ask me, you know, hey, what you're doing, I want to know that because I'm a president that's involved in your lives. Shared governance, it's, it's what it is, what it says. How are we doing on time? We good? Okay, good. Shared governance is, what does it say? The base word, sharing in the governance, right? I don't think it's really rocket science. It's just, again, open communication leads to shared governance where you feel comfortable enough to go and say, hey, Jeff, uh, I want you to think about this. And I think I should be open enough because, again, the relationships we have now may not always end up the way you want, but it's really about sharing in the governance of the college. It's about people in the professional staff, the faculty have voices, they have ideas. And as I looked at the, the data, I was telling somebody earlier, 144 of the people on this campus have been here more than 10 years. Now, I can't, couldn't come in as president and know more than you who've been here for more than 10 years. I'm going to come in and know more about Jackson than you do. I mean, that, that, it, I think it, it makes a lot of sense to share the governance, to take the professionalism that each of you have and listen to that and make that as part of our plan and what we do. And again, I love uh, achieving the dream. Again, your focus on that. I, I've had experience in achieving the dream, actually, as far as why Jackson worked achieving the dream at Elgin Community College was a part of their intercultural part, a part of working with the uh, students that are, dis, you know, excuse me, that uh, had to do developmental. I've worked with, again, uh, students in high schools and trying to get people to transition for any areas of working with um, African-American males and getting uh, non-traditional age students to come to the campus. As it know, 66% of the people in the service area have associate's degrees. Boy, that's prime, that's prime ground for us to increase the number of people here that could use a, a bachelor's, or excuse me, an associate's degree. I love your strategic plan of access, success, completion, retention, underrepresented students, and then your anchor model of advising. And again, it's all about through the relationships. So I'm very excited. I think I have the skill set to, to do the things that you have here. I've had the experience in all these areas, so that's kind of why Jackson State. And so a little levity now, okay? 
Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, okay, who would deny me, who would deny me an opportunity to be with a grandson, all right, who actually lives in Jackson, Tennessee, okay? My son has been on this campus. Actually, did you call him yet? No, I didn't. All right, get on that. He's actually counseled your students. He's a transfer uh, advisor with, uh, with Union University. So my, my, I, I come here for Christmas. We come, here all, we come here often. My son, again, graduated from Union as well as his wife. And my grandson, Simeon James, who chases his grandpa around because I look, my son looks like me. I look like him, one of the two. But, you know, so why Jackson? I have a lot of reasons here. I, have, I think Ty's here. Actually, I really do think that everything that you offer and you're doing at the college, I think that I'm per And so, yeah, that head, he does. He looks just like me, doesn't he? A younger, look at that guy. Anyway, so... Um, that's, that's, my, that's, my plea, that's my exhibit one of my circumstantial evidence of why Jackson, so just add me that one in, all right? That's one of the reasons. I just want you to know about that. Come on, who could deny this guy? All right, Horace, I guess now I've got to go to the, the tough part of the jury. Now, now I'm going to be under the question and answer part. You can turn. I'm good with that. There we go. Thank you. He's cute, isn't he? Yes, he is. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Boyd, for that, those comments and a great presentation. Um, we'll now open up for the question and, and answer session. Um, and if you would, we have two mics down below. State your name, uh, title, department. Make sure that you speak into the mic so that you can be clearly heard. And um, at the end of the session, or near the end, once we get about five minutes, at that point, I will notify the audience and Dr. Boyd. So, um, we'll start to my right, traditionally with um, Scott Cohen, please. Dr. Boyd. Yes, sir. Okay. As we visited your library earlier, you know uh, we are actually going through a renovating a library. I mean, obviously, you need study spaces. You need places for students to have kind of hubs for learning. Internet access, I think, you know, whiteboards where students can get in, in study groups and work together. Places where you can just have, you know, kind of innovative thoughts. Be great if you could bring classes of faculty in there so when you're doing research, they can all meet in rooms and, again, have all the things that are, again, a 21st century library, the connectivity, but also just what they call learning hubs, where students can actually get in there and learn and feel good about getting in with classmates to work on assignments. And, again, the, obviously the digital means that are needed for the, you know, not only the print, but now also the, the digital and the stuff that's online through all the different subscriptions. So I think just again, as we walk the library, yeah, you need some, you know, study rooms for, for students to gather in and place for faculty to also use the library, make a better utilization when you're doing various research papers and things in the library. Thanks. You're welcome. Uh, Dr. Boyd, could you tell us as president how you would, um, how you could support our athletic programs and possibly even uh, make those better? Yeah. Well, I'm going to work with the basketball team um, immediately to, to increase that free throw percentage, okay? That, that's got to that's gotta happen right away because we should be shooting as a team above 70-some percent. But anyway, but no, I think athletics, again, I, I share that. All my boys played athletics in high school. One of my sons went on and had a four-year basketball scholarship, and I know what, what teamwork does, and, and I think it, it goes beyond the classroom. First of all, they need to be student athletes. Classroom first, you know, not just coming just to play that particular sport, but they're here to complete their academic pursuits, so that's got to be first. But then just everything that an athletic program brings, one, to an institution, I think there's pride in that when you're, you know, you show teams you're being successful. I think it attracts other students that have those desires to play sports in high school. It may get that, that, that kid to think about coming to college because of athletics. And I think it just does good for what it builds in team. Some of the greatest lessons I learned was with, with teammates that I grew up with and played sports with. And you learn teamwork. You learn a lot of things about how to solve problems. You learn that hard work and dedication gets you there. So I, I fully believe in athletics and would support it because I think of what it brings, not only for it to teach young men and women about competition. And you know, there, there is, yeah, you play to win, but there's also the value that the things you learn in losing at the same time. So I think athletics are important for an institution. I think it's a good, it's a good also, a, I think when you, you have a good, you know, hopefully a good winning team, every team's gotta be undefeated, I think, right? There's no reason to lose. Why do we lose? I mean. I always, I always like to tell my, when I coach them with my son's teams, you know, lose only when you lose to a better team. 
don't don't lose don't lose to a team that's not better than you. So I believe in athletics and what support it because I think of what it does for not only for the student but also for the institution. Hey, Dr. Boyd. Hello. My name is Rashid Bates, and my major is business administration, mm -hmm. and I'm also a member of BSA, well, representative of BSA, and I was wondering, what are you going to do to ensure that Jackson State continues to grow, not only just Jackson State, but also yourself? Well, Jackson State's going to grow by, um, again, getting students to the finish line. You know, that, that's how we grow. That's how we're funded. So I think it's very important to con connect with those students early, to make sure students understand what their path is through, through advising, you know, again, through the anchor model. But make sure that students, when they come in, they, they have a path. One of the, like I was telling you earlier, when I went to that, that counselor and they said, so what do you want to do? I said, I think I want to be a police officer. And they asked me, do you think you ever want to go for a bachelor's degree? And I said, yes. That was a very important question. So then for the rest of my career because I had completed those right courses that helped set me for the rest of the career. So I think it's very important for Jackson to grow and to continue to be prosperous. We have to make sure the students that are coming through our doors are successful. And we have to make sure that we're putting every tool in their hand as part of, again, we talk about the uh, core values and what you believe in, to make sure we're putting student the best possible uh, tools in front of those students so they can be successful. That's how we're measured. That's how we're funded. So it behooves all of us to make sure we're reaching those benchmarks as students are being successful in you know, the 12, 24, 36, and then on to completion of a certificate or degree. So I think that's very important. And for myself, I think it's, all, it's always continuous improvement. I don't think I'm going to go for any other degree to grow uh, myself. I thought about it. I don't think that's going to happen. But again, professional development opportunities, I think as I, you take a, a new position, you're going to grow from, you're going to learn from the people that you work with. You're going to learn different styles of leadership, learn all the things that come along. Again, for the most part, I've, I've done a lot of the things that it takes to the president as far as in the community, going out and, and working with different you know, funders or those type of things. But I'm going to continue to grow as I'm going to learn from the, the folks that I work with and continue to always better myself. I don't think I'm going to go for another degree, but you never know. Thank you, Dr. Boyd. Thank you. Welcome to our campus. Thank you. My name is It's on. Um, great question. From theory and practice, the, you know, the president is the face of the institution. So I think as you go out and you talk about fundraising, I think it's one of the one of the things that would always be open on my calendar is when the foundation calls about, hey, we'd like you to talk to someone to make myself available, obviously, because they have to look at more forms of alternative funding to fund the college. I think that's that's the president's job I always to be available fund for the foundation, not only to seek funds myself. Maybe people that you can help the phone. Hey, can you talk to these folks who are interested? But then also when you need me to talk, and not only me, what I, what I also believe in is sometimes certain, certain people that are interested in, they're certain, interested in funding certain programs. So sometimes that means bringing faculty along with you. That means bringing various staff that can actually do presentations for what that particular donor may be interested in. So I think, but again, it, I think it starts with the president. It's one of the prime duties that I would make myself available for because I think that's what, that's what the president does, again, from theory and in practice. Very important. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, the first part, again, I think students are, are important to be engaged. I think you give them opportunities to, for, for leadership, the opportunities to, to be involved. One of the things that we've recently done that was really needed our last uh, college convocation, our opening day, was we actually had a, the students were on a panel. So we had our normal announcements, talk about the beginning of the semester, and then we had a group of students in front to talk to faculty and staff about what can we do to serve those students better? So it was great. I mean, the, the faculty and staff really enjoyed it. And some of the long-term faculty members said that was the best convocation we had. We actually heard from students, and students were involved. And we get students involved in leadership. And we've had, we just had the SACS accrediting body here 
uh, a few weeks ago, and we had students actually being some of the main people in the building to lead them in, to help them, students with them when they drove. So I think it's important to give students growth opportunities to see how they can grow themselves and be a part of the things that are going on campus. With SGA, even now we have an SGA, I am always available. I go to SGA meetings. SGA leaders come. We have you know, a standing meeting where they'll come by you know, once a month and we'll talk about things and they have different leadership initiatives. I'm always happy to go and talk with them because I think, again, it's important to be involved with the, the student government because our job is, again, to get them through. The more engaged a student is on a campus, we know how more successful they'll be. But to make the, this is their home. You know, a, a, college, a community college or college really is, it's all about the student experience. That is the most, the, the college is no better than what the students experience because they're the ones, again, I was telling someone earlier, it's all about the students in the seats. It's all about how many students we have, how many were being successful. So I think getting students involved by, again, giving them opportunities for, for leadership and campus involvement. And with SGA, again, anytime you call me, you need me to come talk to a group, and my door would always be open to you. Thank you. You're welcome. Hi, Dr. Boyd. Hello. I'm Vivian Grooms, Associate Professor of Psychology. Mm -hmm. I'm also a member of our student intervention team, <clears throat> and we um, meet as a team to um, evaluate student needs in general. Um, I'm interested in what your perspective is on having counselors on campus and how many counselors are actually needed in terms of career counselors and um, just individual counselors to support students in student services. Okay. Well, I mean, obviously the counseling function is a, is a prime function. Again, now even more so with, like you said, more students having behavioral issues or outside of the classroom issues that are affecting their lives. I think personal counselors, I think I was talking to Brian, I think there's some positions that are still out there to be funded to talk about having personal counselors. And, you know, because it's really, again, all about the student experience. So I, again, I don't know the number or how that's looked as far as in what you had or the staffing plan for that, but counselors are very important, not only for the personal and the academic side. I mean, we, we are uh, currently doing an accelerated associate's degree, and so we have students that are getting their associate's degree in one year at our campus. And I didn't know until our, one of our counselors told me how many times her students, are, the students in that program are seeing her about issues and really she's the one that's kept them on track and I was like, Kia, you gotta keep these, you gotta keep these students in this program. So I, I know how important the counselors are from talking to her and again, being a part of working in student services before, being a regional student services counselor with Olivet Nazarene University. So I know counseling is key because again, students not only academic counseling, but there's a lot of personal issues that are involved in counseling. So I can't give you a number that is needed, but I, I know counseling is very important because it's a support for students. And when students have more needs than we're aware of, and only by counseling and talking to people let those needs be known. And then as a college, it's our job to try to figure out how we can help those students succeed. You're welcome. Good afternoon, Dr. Boyd. Good afternoon. I'm, Misha, I'm Misha Daniels, the Director of Distance Education mm -hmm. here at Jackson State. My question to you was, um, it's kind of two parts. Could you give me insights to your experiences working with distance education programs and course offerings and how you guys are able to offer those to traditional and non-traditional students? And also, could you tie in, which is part two, some of the positive impacts from those programs as it relates to completion rates, student retention rates, and job placement rates? Wow, that's a loaded question. All right, let me see if I can get to that. <laughs> okay. Well, first of all, I am a, a, a advocate for distance education. My Perfect. master's, I got that online, actually. So I, I know that, again, I also know that in the adult learning theory, adult students, students that are, are everybody's not great at online learning because I think you have to have, with adults, you have to have an, you know, internal motivation. You have to be able to um, understand you know, what, what you're doing. But I think this education is very important. It's important to reach many people. And I always think that, again, in our accelerated program, as I just mentioned, one of the courses in each one of the sessions, there's 12 week sessions, and in each session there's an online component. So I think it's important because that's where, again, students, and especially in theory classes, I believe very much in what distance education can do. I think it's important, it's here to stay, but I think it's also how do we, you know, make sure that um, they're, they're, everything that's in there, again, in a traditional classroom, making sure all, you know, the faculty they are teaching it have all the tools they need, all the right rubrics. And so I believe that it very much in distance education is very effective and I support it. What was the second part of your question? 
Um, the positive impacts you've had uh, working with distance education programs in relation to program completion rates, student retention rates, and job placement rates. Yes, yeah, and I think that, again, very important because of the time it saves. And also I'd like to mention, mm -hmm. I've taught online. I taught online criminal justice for probably six years uh, at, when I was at Elgin Community College. So I'm very much in the distance education. I understand theory. I love setting up. I, I believe distance education is, I think you should create critical thinkers. I think it's, you know, sometimes I think in diseducation, if you just have multiple choice tests, I used to like to always, you know, not use multiple choice tests in distance learning. I think it's important. Students are going to complete, you want them to think critically because that's what employers are asking for. They're asking for how do students think critically. So I think distance education, when it's used properly, help that. So I think, one, it's important for placement because it can get students through sooner. And like, you know, you talk about as a, myself as a, a dad that was working full time, I, if I didn't have an opportunity to take my class by distance, I probably wouldn't have been able to complete it. So it's been very important for me. And again, it's all about the learner. You have to make sure they have the tools, they're prepared, that the, I think the learning objectives have to be clear. And I always say in a distance education, one of the most important thing is your syllabus, mm -hmm. your online syllabus, so students can know, okay, this is due, when it's due, what's expected of me. And so, you know, some of the, the talk has always been, it should be fully online. But you also, if you need to make sure, again, through now with all the wonderful things you can do with WebEx, there, I've seen that uh, one of my colleagues is going through a, a doctorate program, and they actually, they actually have WebEx classes where all the students are, it's online, they do it right from home, but everybody's in a classroom, and they're in their own home, but they're having a live WebEx class, it's still fully distance learning. So I think it's important for success because of what it can do and the people that it can reach, and again, People have lives. Life gets in the way. You want to be a, you know, a sick kid or you might be traveling. So I think it's very important and it can help people succeed. Thank you very so much, I support sir. It. Mr. Chase, Darren has given me the right away. <laughs> we had informal communications while you weren't looking. Uh, my name is Emily Fortner and I'm an associate professor of sociology here at Jackson Hello. State. Actually, I'm a graduate from a high school in Virginia with a father who worked at Richard Bland Community College oh, really? in Virginia. Yeah, so right. we have some connections. Right. Yeah. Um, so you actually just spoke a little bit about some online teaching in criminal justice and we didn't really get to hear a lot um, from the beginning in terms of any um, faculty experience at the college level in terms of teaching that you may have. Um, and I know from, from reviewing your CV, um, most of your experience seems to be more in that administrative student mm -hmm. services advising type role and not necessarily full-time faculty member. Um, so correct me if I'm wrong and give us well, some information. Do you want me to answer that now? Sure. Okay. So I taught at the Elgin Community College. If you looked at my CV, it, it showed that I taught uh, adjunct instructor yes. at Elgin Community College. I taught in the criminal justice area. Yes. Okay, because with that qualification as a faculty member, I have an associate's in criminal justice. I have nine years of police experience, so I can teach in that that program. Some again, some pro some courses in that in that discipline were transferred. So I actually have taught at a college level for like six years as an adjunct instructor in criminal justice. So I did have that experience. And then also, again, as a um, dean, I've evaluated faculty. I've worked with faculty through tenure. I, I've worked with faculty in every aspect. But I actually have taught at a community college level classes that equal into a AAS degree. So I fully qualify, and I believe I'd be qualified here as well to teach in that, in that discipline of like in a criminal justice type class. Fantastic. Um, so I think you kind of already answered my question in terms of um, for full-time faculty, traditionally um, a president would have some distinguished teaching experience is I think the, the mm -hmm. term in our mm -hmm. job description. Um, and so to not have that experience as a, as a full-time faculty member, um, if faculty had fears about that, do you have anything to subside those fears or yeah, any information? I, I, really, I, don't, I think, you know, I'm not sure why they would have fears of that because I think, one, you know, they're the content experts. I'm the content expert and if criminal justice, I could be considered a content expert. But in actually the faculty teaching, I think that's why faculty are there. I see the presidential job as a leadership position. Leadership is influence, nothing more, nothing less. For the fact that I have taught in a classroom, and the fact that I have worked with faculty and evaluated them, I don't see why you have any fears. I think I, I've, I've worked through almost every aspect of, of teaching, every aspect of tenure, again, understanding what, what you know, again, faculty go through. I do have two years of high school teaching as well. So I think that, you know, again, to think that you would uh, need necessarily 
um, a record that if, if you're going to be a full-time faculty member, then that's really what you should go for. I think as a president, that's not necessarily, maybe at some universities or whatever, but here I think it's more about, I think that's why we have qualified, great full-time faculty in roles so they can do the teaching. I see the president's job as a leadership position. I think, again, I do have, I feel I have distinguished teaching because I think I've had great evaluations, again, teaching for six years. So I think, again, not being a full-time instructor, I think those would really not be warranted fears. I think I understand and work well with faculty throughout my career. Great. Thank you. You're welcome. Is it Darren's turn now? Go ahead, Darren. Thank you. <laughs> Hello. Good afternoon, Dr. Boyd. How you doing? Good. Um, I'm Darren Billings. I'm Director of Environmental Health and Safety, Chief of Police here at Jackson State. And uh, my question to you is in regards to safety and campus safety and security. Of course, there's an ongoing thing across campus and, uh, and across the nation as to increase campus security and campus safety due to events that have happened across our nation. What is your vision going forward uh, to possibly enhance safety, to enhance security on our campus mm -hmm. going forward? Well, um, again, I think you look at my, my cover letter and, and so, I mean, my resume and so forth. Again, I was a police officer. And at um, each of the campuses that I worked at, actually, I was instrumental in beginning to make sure that we were uh, aware. And we did all the emergency things for campus active shooter type training to make sure a campus was well prepared on, on any incident that would happen like that. So I fully support and believe in getting to make sure people are trained. And again, I understand we have armed officers on this campus, which I think is great and necessary because you can't, you know, the faculty and staff can't be comfortable if they don't feel like they're in a safe environment. So I think that's the first and the primary and foremost is that we make sure that we that our environment is safe and that people can feel safe in what when they come to work every day. So I think that's very important. I am a big supporter of whatever we need to do to make sure that our campus can be safe. And that's in again, you know, increasing the number of officers that we have if that's a possibility. Uh, talk to Horace about that. But if you, if you want to talk about, you know, making sure a campus is safe, I don't think you'll find a better proponent for that because that's my background and I believe in really training people. And you think about it, it's, it's all mental. It's like, you know, you talk about, uh, uh, you know, you get in an airplane and you go through all the things of what you're supposed to do. So it's really about giving people the knowledge up here to know what they need to do in case there are certain things that happen. But I'm all supporting in what we need to do to make our campus safe. First and foremost, we have to have a safe campus, safe learning environments. Thank you, sir. Dr. Boyd, I'm Nell Center, and I'm Dean of Social and Behavioral Sciences, within mm -hmm. which criminal justice falls, so good to know you have that experience. Um, I was impressed by the years of experience you've had in working to build um, and to attract minority male students to attract and retain them. Mm -hmm. um, and I have another completely unrelated question that I'll ask after. but. Um, I wonder if, because of that experience, if you could speak to how you might work with Jackson State. Um, I know you worked with building workshops for faculty and others. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, I'm interested in, in how you would work with all of our constituencies, but particularly faculty and students, to help attract and retain minority male students that would better represent the demographics of our area. Well, again, like as you read, I mean, what, one of the things I did when I was at Wabansi was we got a uh, we got a team together. We had a we had a theater department, and so what we did is we teamed up with the theater department because I wasn't going to be an actor, you know. But we talked about how we could go out into the high schools, and so we actually went out and did a, we did skits at the high school uh, uh, during their uh, whatever you call it their time when we went to the high school, and we actually went and we did skits about I am going to college. So what we did is we we had students who. We had two cool guys. One guy was a high school basketball star. The other guy was kind of the nerd on campus. And so we, we talked about one guy being cool, a basketball player in high school. And then we fast forwarded 10 years. And so then we had him come back. And here's the guy that was a former basketball star, now was you know flipping burgers somewhere. And we have the guy that was a nerd that pursued his education. And now he's a, you know, a polished accountant making you know, six figures doing well. And so what we try to do is get those students to see, you know, <laughs> oh. So we'll bring Horace out as one of the actors, obviously. And that was not planned. Proceed. Okay. <laughs> that was not planned. So we try, 
I didn't even, I really, I didn't even, I forgot you were there, to be honest with you. So, um, <laughs> so we, we worked on that. But then also, you know, I think it's very important for uh, a campus culture. When I work with those students, and you know, a lot of times it's not really knowing that. I always tell the story of a, a actually it was an accounting professor that uh, she was, she was very good. Paula was a great friend of mine. Paula was a very professional looking, blonde haired, blue eyed, very good looking lady. And so she was, she was teaching, and so one of the students I was working with came and they told me, and they said, oh, I think I'm gonna drop this class because she intimidates me. And I said, Paula, are you kidding me? I said, let's go. So we walked down to Paula's office and I said, Paula, what are you doing to my students? You're intimidating them. She goes, I am. She goes, I, I didn't know I was doing that. So really, Paula ended up being that student's mentor because I think part of the job is to help break down. You, you, when you have not gone, depending on where you were raised and what you went through. Sometimes people scare you just because they look at you it's funny and they think they don't like. So we worked a lot with faculty and staff that when students would bring in forms that were filled out wrong, instead of saying, well, you got this all wrong, you would say, you know what, you did pretty good, except, you know, you just left out a couple of things. We can fix that, darling. And one thing about the South, everyone calls you darling and they call you, you know, sweetheart and all that. So just use a lot of that love and to get people but really to help people just, you know, get rid of those fears, work with people in training that it's all about human relationships. It's really all about how you make people feel. And what I always say, people don't want to know, they don't care how much you know till they know how much you care. So it's all about building the caring culture, which is, which again, I've, I've had nothing but to feel that feeling here, but then to help students get that. And then also I realized again how important, a real quick story about a guy named Wayne, a basketball player. So when I was working in that minority student retention position, Wayne was a guy, went on the basketball team, Wayne had dreadlocks, Wayne was a cool guy out, and so one day I come back and Wayne's cut off the dreadlocks and he's got a hair, well that's when I had a little more hair, had hair cut a little bit more like mine. And I said, Wayne, what happened to the dreadlocks? And he goes, oh man, I gotta get that Boyd look. That's gonna be success for me, I know that. And he goes like, and I never thought that I was making, I was thought I need to be cool to make Wayne, to kind of identify with Wayne, and I really realized then how important it is to be uh, you know, someone that's out there, people are looking at you and that you need to be a great mentor. But many people are mentors. And again, Dr. Murphy and I are, are different, but Dr. Murphy, all he did was cared about me and he, he made me feel like I could do anything. And Dr. Murphy was, again, it was just about relationships. So it's about, again, it's all about relationships, how you make people feel. And so that's all you do. You, bring, you know, help people get on campus to realize, first of all, the value of education. Where are you going to go? The only way you're going to get out of where you're at is in education. You know, I'm the first generational student, first one in my family to graduate from college. My mom was the first one to graduate from high school. So I know the value of education because, again, education takes you places and you, we improve people's lives by learning. And that's what, we, that's what you do here at Jackson State. Okay. Um, thank you. The, the other question is in terms of rebuilding the campus leadership team. Mm -hmm. I was interested in how you worked with faculty on that target of rebuilding. What do you, mean? you say here you rebuilt the campus leadership team. Oh, what well, is the campus leadership team? Well, at that particular time, we were we were team? down um, a dean of student services, we were down a, a business dean, and so we had, and then we had an, another interim position of a director position that was down. So I had to actually work to hire great people to help build our campus culture. So rebuilding the team was meaning I hired people and helped get good people in position to help build that team. Now again, faculty were on those search committees. Faculty were some of the people that helped select. It wasn't like I picked folks out. We had faculty you know, leads and faculty in those areas that were the program leads in those areas were the ones that actually also you know, bought in and said, yeah, that's a good person to have in that team. So faculty was a big part of that and that they were on the search committee and they, they were the ones who say, hey, we think we can work with this, this person. So that's what I mean by that. All right, thank you. You're welcome. We have five minutes remaining. Um, anyone have any final question? Scott, please. Dr. Boyd, uh, one of my passions is staff development and I wanted to know how you feel about that and how you do that here at Jackson State to promote staff development, not just for faculty development, but staff also. Well, it's very important. We talked about it a little bit at lunch. I mean, I think everyone wants to have an opportunity to grow. So I think I would, you know, work in, as we talked about, through the budget process to work with those, those leaders and those uh, folks that are supervising staff and talk about try to how we can find ways to get that in their budgets to make sure staff have an opportunity to grow. 
because everyone wants the opportunity to grow. So I think it's important, one, that that's, that's vocalized and that people know it and that your supervisors know that that's what you want to do and then find a way to work that out so we can make that available for everybody can have the same opportunities to grow. Thank you. You're welcome. Any final questions? There being none, thank you, Dr. Boyd. And thank you, audience, for your participation and attendance. Thank you.